Let's see who's here. In three, two, one. Three, two, one. Welcome everyone. It is 12 noon Pacific and it's time for another episode of The Dough Doctor. I'm your host and baking expert, Chef Colette, and today's episode I'm going to answer all your questions and then at the end of the class we'll call back to that cheesecake we baked last week and we're going to get it out of the pan. Thank you so much for joining me. Oh. I'm so psyched for this week's show because the heat wave has broken. Put it in the comments if it's cooler where you are and where and and with the cooler temperatures do you feel inspired to bake? I know I do. Look what I made this morning. Look, I made a beautiful loaf of honey whole wheat bread. And I didn't pass out from turning on the oven and being in this hot kitchen. How great is that? Yay! So, I hope you're inspired for fall baking. We're going to talk about that in just a second. Hey, Leo, I see people saying hi in the comments. And um, it's just so great to see you. Anyway. I'm super pumped and inspired because it's not so bleeding hot. Not that we don't love summer and all the fun that summer brings, but it's really not the best for baking. And I want to shout out and thank you guys for sticking with me all summer long, even through those excruciating heat waves. All right, so I've got a couple questions to start. And what I would like you to do, if you have more questions that came up this week, or maybe you've got some questions that are just rattling around your head about baking, or maybe you have a little index card, and you know what? That would not be a bad idea to keep a little notebook or index card in the kitchen and jot your questions down as they come up. And then just either send them to me or wait for the Friday post and drop them in the comments. All right, you ready for the questions? Um, let's go. Okay, all right. Now I had a question. I know some of you like to make laminated doughs. Maybe you were in my craftsy class mastering um, classic, uh, my goodness, my croissant class. Classic croissant modern techniques. That's the name of that one. Or any of the laminated dough classes on craftsy. And you have questions. Well, a question came in about puff pastry. Also, all my culinary students in the audience, we certainly made you make puff pastry a couple of times. And for those of you who maybe haven't had an on-ground class or online class with me, maybe you just dream about making puff pastry or buying it. Well, this is a puff pastry question. One of our bakers wrote in, and she said she was making her puff pastry and the butter block, because there's two parts, there's the dough and there's the butter block and the two of them are layered together, the butter block wouldn't hold together and it was tearing through the dough. And I bet many of you can answer this question. There was one thing wrong with her butter and that is it was too cold. So whenever you're working on a laminated dough, which would be croissant, danish, or puff pastry, there are more, and I have a piggyback question. You're going to be so shocked. This came out of left field. You know that the butter has to be a temperature at which it's plastic. In other words, we can mold it. Now, I almost threw together a butter block to illustrate this point. And as we move further into the cooler weather, I certainly will. 
but what you want to be able to do is to roll the butter on the edge of the counter or bend it and it doesn't crack. So to answer her question, the butter is too cold, let it just sit out for about 10 or 15 minutes, covered, we always cover our doughs, no matter what they are, yeasted or not yeasted, when they're sitting out so they don't dry out, and then go back and start laminating again. It's all about the laminating. So that's that question. Now here's a piggyback question about um, laminated doughs from Italy. And I know that Leonora at Leo is in the audience and she is my sister-in-law from Milan, so she may have heard of this. Please, Leo, put it in the comments if you have. And um, I was contacted by a baker, an American baker, who asked me if I'd ever heard of a Cremona. Well, a Cremona, Cremona to me, is a town in Italy where they build violins. I had never heard of a Cremona. A quick Google search led to two things, just two. Normally we search and we get millions. No, just two. So here's the dealio. A Cremona, for my baker who asked, a Cremona is an Italian laminated dough from the region of, from Cremona. It is a very distinct shape and instead of butter, they use lard. So, I know, I could feel the backlash. I know we don't bake a lot of with lard these days. Maybe some of you have a special pie crust you do around Thanksgiving. But, um, so classically, the Cremona pastry would be made with lard. But I've got some books coming from the library. I had to dig in the vault of the LA Public Library to find some recipes and guidance. So in a few short weeks, we'll explore this really delicious looking pastry called a Cremona. For those of you who have been to Italy, you know that every region you visit offers up some pastry delights that's unique to that region. And this was the first I've heard of it. You know, it made me think of that wonderful movie from the late 90s, The Red Violin. I don't know, put it in the comments if you know that movie. It was just awesome, especially Joshua Bell standing in for the violin playing actor. Yes, Leo, I thought about asking Chef Daniel too, but I, I just hadn't quite got around to it. I don't see him in the audience yet, but maybe he'll pop in. All right, everyone, so puff pastry, and then it's Italian cousin, Cremona. And then, um, this was a good one. One of our bakers wrote in and said she had been looking at cinnamon roll recipes on online and specifically Pinterest. And why was it that some cinnamon roll recipes use all-purpose flour and some use bread flour? Hmm. That's a very good question. Well, some cinnamon roll recipes, in fact, our cinnamon roll recipe that we're currently using in the Escoffier program uses all-purpose flour instead of bread flour in order to give it a really tender um, bite, a little bit more softness. Now, that doesn't mean you can't use bread flour, but the difference is if you use all-purpose flour and you want to use a good brand like King Arthur or Gold Medal um, or maybe you have a favorite organic brand of all-purpose flour, uh, what that will do is give your cinnamon rolls just a slightly more melt-in-the-mouth um, texture. Uh, they'll be a little bit sturdier with the bread flour, but they'll still be good. As a matter of fact, for King Arthur fans, King Arthur bread flour is 12.7% protein and King Arthur all-purpose is 11.7% protein. 
just one percentage difference. So you can see where those two, specifically that brand, would be very interchangeable. What we want to avoid for cinnamon rolls, just across the board, um, is bleached all-purpose flour. Now we talk about this all the time on the show, but we want to avoid for any of our yeasted doughs, we want to use, we want to not use bleached all-purpose flour, which are usually the less expensive or generic brands, are usually um, they are usually bleached, it'll say so on the package, and the bleaching process interferes with the, the gluten development, and when we're trying to roll dough out, it becomes very springy. And we're coming up on our Thanksgiving pie marathon, so I'm gonna say it here, I'll say it over and over again until we get past Thanksgiving, try to avoid bleached flour except for cakes. Um, and really, really read your labels. Stop in the baking aisle, grab that bag of flour, read the label before you toss it into your cart. Make sure you're buying unbleached and also be bleached flour is not the best thing for our bodies, but then I hope we're not eating cake every day. So that was a great question. Yes, exactly, Katie. It is a little tougher with bread flour. Croissants are the same. We make croissants with bread flour. They're a little bit chewier than they are made with all-purpose, like a good all-purpose flour. So excellent point. We get a little bit more chew. All right, and last question for today. I had a baker write in about corn syrup in caramel recipes. Specifically, she was making those yummy, and I mean they are so yummy, the um, marshmallows that are dipped in caramel. I don't know about you guys, but there's a candy store by the house, and I just stop and stare at those gorgeous caramel-wrapped marshmallows. Well, our baker was DIYing her own, and I salute her, because this whole ch our whole show is about doing things ourselves. Not that we can't admire beautiful work along the way and that just helps us get inspired and be better at whatever it is that we're baking. But what I told her is, um, oh Renee, I'm so sorry. Uh, thank you so much for joining and thank you for your comment. Uh, what I told her, she doesn't want to use uh, corn syrup in any form. So here's the thing, for a regular caramel, let's say you're making a flan, um, or just a simple caramel sauce, you can get away with no corn syrup or no glucose, because in some parts of the world, glucose, which is corn syrup, uh, it's related to corn syrup, it's a little bit more refined, um, you can get away without using it. But if you're making candies that need to be shelf stable, maybe packaged and shipped, then you do need that corn syrup. It will help not only your finished product, not um, the sugar not crystallize in the making, but if it's traveling or being stored or being sold, that corn syrup is a really big help. So, and the corn syrup, the caro syrup that we buy, is not quite the evil of the high fructose corn syrup that's in soft drinks and, and processed foods. However, it is not something we want to eat every day. All right? Okay, that's it for questions. I'm gonna quick scroll through the comments and see if um, anybody has any questions for today. Great. All right, so now I think we're doing pretty well. I want to move into demo, and of course, please add questions as you go. If you have questions about demo, put those in the comments as well. Okay, so last week we made our cheesecake, and it's still in the refrigerator. I actually froze it once it was cooled, and I chilled it for a little while. I put it in the freezer until last night, 
And then last night, I moved it to the refrigerator. Now, you guys remember, it's in a cake pan. It's not in a springform pan. This is the world's oldest springform pan, by the way. Um, but that's okay. And so we know that this pan, if we had baked our cheesecake in this pan, what we would do is we would just, after we took it out of the water, after we peeled off the three, one, two, three layers of aluminum foil, we would um, just release, this would come up, and our cheesecake would be sitting on this base of the world's oldest springform pan. I'm kidding, it's not that old. I like it though. I, I had this when I had my bed and breakfast in Massachusetts, and I just can't part with it. Sorry, Marie Kondo, I just can't do it. I love this pan. All right, but I want to show you something that I didn't show you last week when you're using a springform pan. I talked all about the foil. I had you pretty well prepared, but I felt there was a question it from like it was burbling at me all week. Just one of you asking me, and, and put it in the comments if this crossed your mind last week, but what if I wanted to get this out of the pan because I was taking it to an event and I didn't want to lose the base? All right. So what you would do is you have to make a modified sling. And you can do this for any round cake pan. Now i got to put it back together. Um, and what you're going to do is you're going to take parchment paper, and this, this is about three inches wide, it depends on your pan, and you want to lay the strips in so that they line the pan where the, they, they line the pan nice and flat. And you're going to do one, and then you're going to do another one on top, and of course you're gonna first you'll have greased the pan and then you'll grease the strips. And I know my regulars know that my preferred method of greasing a pan is cake goo. And I have it right here. This is a combination of vegetable oil, flour, and shortening. And it literally lasts forever. I use it to grease all my pans and I avoid this evil because this is evil, pan spray, as much as possible. There could be absolutely nothing worse for the environment than this. Anyway, I digress. So anyway, so you would just grease it, you would grease the strips, you would press in the crust, you would go from there. Now one thing, and like I said, you can do this for other cakes, you can do this for loaf cakes, but let's troubleshoot really quickly. This is what I see my bakers do. The, the sling should only be enough paper over the top so that you can lift, maybe a half inch to an inch. If they're too tall, then the bake is in here, is the, the heat circulating ar around the pan gets inhibited. Like it just, it doesn't hit the product properly. And you're thinking, well, it's just a piece of paper. It does make a difference. So that's how, so when this was perfectly cool and well chilled, preferably frozen, you would gently loosen where there is no strip. You know, you would make sure that everything was clear and then you could release it out of the pan and then lift up, lift up your bottom and then put it onto a cardboard round and you would be good to go off to your event, bake sale, whatever's going on without losing the bottom of that pan. Patty has, uh, Patty asked for the recipe for cake goo and I will put it, um, I'm gonna do a short blog post explaining finishing the cake and I will put my recipe for cake goo um, in there, uh, on in that post, it makes this much. 
I find there are recipes for cake goo on the internet, but they make a grip of cake goo, and unless you're in serious production, this will last for a couple of months, and quite honestly, I like to make things fresh, fresh, kind of fresh, Fr you know, so I don't want this to sit in my fridge for a year, though it could, nothing would happen. So, Patty, a, a reasonable recipe for cake goo will be in the next uh, blog post on uh, bakingwithcolette.com. For those of you who look at my website, you know that, re that um, recipes and tutorials, you're going to find that under the tab, recipes and blog posts. I have other content on there, like archived episodes of our show. All right, so now, drum roll! Here we go. Here's our cake. So what we're going to do is I have the oven on at 350. And uh, I'm actually going to take... The oven's on at 350. I have a cardboard round. And I'm going to show you an old cordon bleu trick. Something we used to do way back in the day. If anybody's on from LCB, you will know what I'm going to do. But this is just such an awesome hack. It's just great. So I love showing this to you guys. I made sure that um, the cake was loosened from the pan with an offset spatula. I'm going to take this cardboard round, and I got these. I get these from Amazon. I like them. They have a little silicone coat, so you can reuse them. You know, let's say if you're like layering a cake, and this might sound crazy. Well, I think, uh, but if I have cardboards that um, get a little, you know, get a little bit of cake schmutz on them, but they're not totally, you know, I can use them for layering. I, I wipe them off and I stick them in the freezer and they stay fine. There's your sustainable baking for you right there. Okay, so now I have, I have tight, um, I have plastic wrap on this cardboard round and I'm going to put it in my oven, which is at 350, for 10 seconds. Maybe not even 10. One, two, three, four. Yeah. All right. I went a little bit too long. Change that to three seconds. And it shrink wraps it. Isn't that cool? So now, what we're going to do is we're going to take the, our shrink-wrapped cardboard round because if we don't shrink-wrap it, then the cake is going to stick to the cardboard. But with the plastic wrap, it's not going to stick. So we're going to flip it out like that. And it is not going to come out because it's stuck in there. But... This is if you have one of these creme brulee torches, or maybe maybe you're married to somebody who has who is a plumber and has a propane torch. Well, that works great too. Let me make sure I made sure this was going before. Always got to test when you go live, you know, because things just happen. And you're gonna take your little torch and you're going to go around, you're just going to blow the flame on the bottom. These torches are great. You can get, not only can you do your creme brulee, but you can get um, bubbles out of glazes. Super, super cool. That's probably enough. going to put my pink mitts on. Pink is my favorite color. And then I'm going to
there it goes. Isn't that exciting? I think it's really fun. And then we're going to, if you remember, we had a piece of parchment on the bottom. So you can now, we're going to, I'm going to put it on a serving platter because I'm not going to, I'm not, oh, wait a second. Haha, <laughs> look what was in the freezer. One of these very pretty uh, cake uh, boards. This is a reuse. And then I just stick it in the freezer and just stays there till I need it again. So I'm going to center it over the cake and I'm going to flip. And the top of the cake is perfect. So now we can peel off the shrink wrap plastic wrap. Remember that was one, two, three, four seconds, three to four seconds. And I can, it's perfectly clean and uh, safe to use again. All right, so now we have the um, uh, we have our, can you guys see? Ooh, that's perfect. All right, you can see just fine. I'm gonna just do a quick finish on this cake. Um, oh, Chef Brandon, I'm so glad. Chef Brandon was one of my Escoffier graduates audience and it, I'm so happy to see him in the audience and he made a comment that he had never thought of this. So yay, that's awesome. Oh, another shout out I have to say to two audience members who I don't think they're in the audience, but they messaged me, two, two students, graduates, who went through the whole 15-month remote program without meeting. They sent me a photo. They got to meet today. So that just made my day. So a shout out to Heidi and Mark. All right, let's finish this cheesecake. We have four minutes. All right. If you get any bubbles on the top or you want to smooth out the top of your cheesecake, just grab an offset spatula. This is not a terribly thick cheesecake. I'm not, I'm not a Lindy's thick New York cheesecake type of girl. But at the bottom of last week's, at the bottom of the recipe for this cheesecake, you'll see an increased amount in case you want to make it thicker and there's a little bit of an additional baking time, but that is all in the, in the, um, in the method. Okay, so I made lemon curd. Remember when we made lemon curd a few weeks ago? And I'm gonna top this cheesecake with lemon curd. Not all of it, but I'll have some extra. Ooh. And I'm just going to take my offset spatula and bring this almost to the edge. And smooth it out. Put it in the comments. I think you guys like lemon curd. And you know you can make lime curd, grapefruit curd, passion curd, raspberry curd. Curds, curds, curds. Okay, that looks good. I like to mix I like to mix lemon curd and yogurt. There's a doing my own Nusa brand, that brand of posh yogurt that has so many flavors and it's so good. So anyway, we love lemon curd. So now I whipped I started to whip some cream, but then I thought teaching moment, all right? I know we've done this before and I've whipped cream on camera, held it over my head but I thought I would finish this in the mixer. This cream has no sweetener in it, and it's the consistency of Greek yogurt. And when you're whipping your cream, and what you wanna do is start on medium speed, let it come up to that Greek yogurt consistency. If you're mixing with your mixer, we know if you're mixing by hand, you're just gonna have at it. You know, we have to like do that. You could do the sound effects too, but when it's Greek yogurt consistency, that's when our sugar and our vanilla goes in. This is eight ounces of cold, heavy cream, and 
I have one and a quarter ounces, 35 grams of sugar, powdered sugar. Powdered sugar is really nice for sweetened whipped cream because it's not gritty like granular sugar. And then I have my big, bo big bottle of vanilla. And as I, I have mentioned before, if you, um, if you have a Kroger, I found this at a Kroger grocery store. It is a pint of vanilla and it was $19. Kind of exciting. So that I'm just waving it over the top because it was, it was, uh, it was inexpensive and it's a good, it's good. All right, now this won't take but a minute. High speed, stay with it. Okay, I don't like running the mixer on camera because it's noisy, but I wanted to show you guys, it's still very soft, but it's not, it's not oozing out of the bowl, okay? So you got to stay with it. It's at a nice soft peak. See that peak right there? Because you may not know this. But as you force the whipped cream through the piping bag, because we're going to pipe next, well, when you force it through the bag, you're still developing it, so it can begin to overdevelop and get those little cracks on the edge, um, which we don't want. And one last thing before I pipe and finish up the show, I want you guys to think about when you're piping on your cakes, what size piping tip you're going to use for your borders. A lot of times I saw for many years with students that they would grab the biggest one, like bigger is better. But what I want you to think about, my cake people, I want you to think about the size of the piping tip relative to the size of your cake. Unless you're going for a fact or you're doing some big roses or some fun stuff, then absolutely you know, grab a big tip and go at it and have fun. But for more finer pastry work, I'm going to use, this is an 824, actually. I'm so blind. No, it's an 822. And I'm going to just do a delicate border. Can you see I left a little space between the lemon curd and the... Um, and the edge of the cake. So again, I want to show you that consistency. See how soft that is? No cracks, really, really beautiful and smooth. That's what we're going for. And you know, I know we see a lot of perfection on the internet, but do not put yourself through that. Just know, I'm going to just show you a quick tip that will make piping just like super easy. You always want to burp the bag, and you saw I scraped, I scraped the bag. Oh, my nose is itching, I apologize. I scraped the contents toward the tip. And what you want to do when you're piping on a cake, you want to just you divide the cake into four. So I'm going to start here, I'm going to pipe, then I'm going to turn, I'm going to pipe another quarter, and then I'm going to pipe. And it just it makes it so less stressful. I'm just going to do a simple rosette. And when I get uh, that quarter done, then I just rotate the, the turntable. And if you don't have a turntable, 
you can elevate the cake onto like a, oh, uh, a can of, a 28 ounce can of tomatoes works well, but a little elevation really, really does help. Now the destination for this cake, my neighbor has a lot of family visiting so that's where this cake is going. So I'm really happy that it has a home. Just a couple announcements while I finish up. I will be live for Craftsy.com on Monday, October 3rd at 2 o'clock Central and I'll be demoing pumpkin shaped and pumpkin flavored macarons. And uh, the other thing is any demos that you'd like to see as we gear up for our holiday and fall baking, please just send me a message. I am open for anything. Everyone, thank you so much for joining me here on The Dough Doctor. I look forward to seeing you all week long. And uh, please, if you try the cheesecake, tag me in the photos, because as usual, I love to see your beautiful work. Take care, happy baking, and I'll see you next week. Bye!